you invested in Netflix since they are renting out DVDs, right? What makes you able to hold on to a company's until it 10x, 20x, 50x, 100x and still continue to hold? No, I was just wondering if you were consider local REITs to be a good investment. Are, are you pressured to show people what's your returns, uh, your track record, your Kager over, over these years? Hi friends, welcome back uh, to Backholder Pod. Today we have guest, uh, his name is Chin Hui Leong. On the X or Twitter, his uh, handle is Chin Investor. I think I met him before uh, in a group settings. So I just think that it's uh, very nice to invite friends, come to the pod, having discussion on investing topics. Uh, welcome to the pod, Chin. Happy to be here. Uh, Chin, so for new viewers, right, like those who don't know you in details, uh, do you just want to like give a quick uh, introduction about yourself? Sure. My name is Chin. Wow, this sounds like... So bomber. Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> um, I used to work for the Motley Fool, firstly voluntarily, then with the US side, and then I transitioned to work with uh, Motley Fool Singapore. Uh, that was up till 2019. From there, because the Motley Fool Singapore decided to leave uh, Singapore, myself, Joanna and David Kuo, we decided to form this company called The Smart Investor, where the three of us are co-founders. So I'm the head of investing there. So I, I think uh, Motley Fool, I think it's quite popular. Uh, people heard about the names. Actually, I, I'm not a sub subscriber, so I, I can't say I know the inside <laughs> out of like how mm -hmm. the firm mm -hmm. operate and what's the inve investment philosophy. But one thing I noticed is that you tend to pick companies that have potential to 10x, 100x, so and, and just oh, keep on holding okay. for a long period of time, right? Is that the core principle or core investment philosophy? Do you want to share a bit more on what was your investment philosophy here? Okay, uh, I'll start with the Motley Fool. Uh. So, I mean, th in the Motley Fool, they like to say we are Motley, meaning there's there's no like one style of investing. I, I don't know whether they still have services because I'm no longer with them, by the way. They used to have a service called Insight Value, which is for value investors. They have dividend services. Uh, but over time, I think why they got known for growth investing is because if, if you think of it, about like the world of cooking, there are popular schools of thoughts, right? So I, I think growth became really popular because uh, you know there, there are a lot of hundred baggers, <laughs> ten baggers, and and hundred baggers, and this is primarily the style of uh, David Gardner, who is the co-founder of the Motley Fool. His style of investing, he likes to describe it as closer to uh, venture capital, and uh, I, I think the most striking thing about it is his accuracy may not be very high but his results are still uh, phenomenal. So it goes to show that you don't really have to be right on every single bet, but then when you're right, you, you win really big. I like to describe my style as inspired by David Garner, forged by a very popular member in, on the Motley Fool forums called uh, Tom Engel. Uh, he's from Kentucky. And uh, refined by Jeff Fisher, who's another uh, fund manager within the Motley Fool. I, I think where Tom Angle comes in is he provided the sort of the more nitty gritty, down more detailed approach to investing. He's also a friend. I, I actually drove 12 hours to meet him in Kentucky twice. <laughs> Got to learn from him. So I'm thankful for that. I mean, it's still a bit abstract to, to us, right? Because right. I think maybe we can just run some examples of like how do you pick a companies or what do you look at when oh, you study okay. a, a certain companies. I, I think on your profile page, you mentioned that you invested in Netflix since they are still uh, renting out DVDs, right? Mm -hmm. so how, how do you pick that? And then over the years, the business also evolved, also changed. How, like what makes you able to hold on mm -hmm. to a companies until it 10x, 20x, 50x, 100x, and still continue to hold. Like, what, oh, what kind of ability is that? Uh? Can, can you share with us? If I look at my style of investing, if I summarize it in, in like layman's terms, I look for companies which are already doing well. I try to figure out why they're doing well. And then uh, I try to figure out after that, whatever they've been doing well, can that continue in the future? And I, I think that is the best description of what I do. I tend to like to have a lot of free play, meaning that at the start, I, I like the company to define itself. So I don't like to have like too much criteria around it. I, I, I just want that free play to, to let the company explain themselves. So one of my favorite formats is presentations. It's like a blank sheet of paper, right? The company should be able to explain itself in very simple terms using a blank sheet of paper instead of me having all these metrics coming in and trying to measure you in bits and pieces and not getting the full picture, right? That is how I invest. And your, your question was on Netflix, right? So the interesting thing about Netflix is that I, I think it kind of shows that 
investing criteria may not be as important because when I bought it, it's a totally different company. They were doing DVD by mail. It was 2007. I only started investing for about two years. Honestly, I, I picked it because I thought it was a cool service and it was growing well, right? I, I didn't even know how to calculate a free cash flow back then. It was quite a foreign concept to me. If you remember way back in 2007 in Singapore, I think if you wanted to rent a DVD, you had to go down to the shop, get the DVD, return your DVD, Basically, you have to go down all the way to that, that center, right? I, I know this makes me sound old, but... <laughs> but so I, I, I just thought that this this service, wow, you, you could just mail it. Once you're done, you mail it back and you get your next DVD. And I thought, wow, this is a really cool service, right? Why don't they have this in Singapore? You could see that eventually they have to go to streaming, but I never thought they'll be as successful as they were. I, I do remember a friend asking me before, like, uh, what was your criteria? by Netflix and so on. I was sort of stunned because I couldn't answer his question, which is sort of revealing because like, how is this your biggest winner? And then you do not know how you picked it, right? <laughs> and the truth is, whatever criteria I had back then didn't matter because the company is completely different today. I, I think they shut down their DVD by mail service and it's a completely different company today. And I think quite a number of companies turn out that way, which is maybe a lesson for investors where criteria may not be as important as it looks. And I think mindset is more important for holding for the long term. I think, Chin, it's fairly interesting, right? Can, yeah. can I ask, especially for a lot of investors, right? I think having a two, five bagger, then mm -hmm. they'll immediately have the idea of, oh, I need to lock in my profit. Later, it will come mm -hmm. back down and stuff. But what was that conviction or was there, what's the thought process like when you can hold a stock for like, I don't know, at least 20 oh. years and, and, and you can see it go up, down, up, down. <laughs> and Netflix also had that own cycle of going up and down. How, how did you manage that psychology? Curiosity. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll make two points. Uh. Number one, I did sell half of my Netflix, which was the worst decision ever. <laughs> I think there's a lesson there for investors uh, because so I give you a timeline and then I juxtapose the, the market cycle so you understand the, the full context, right? So I started in 2005, right? So that's two years before the great financial crisis. So, and then market goes up and it crashes down and then it recovers back to, I think, where it was. I, I remember showing a, a chart where from 2005 to 2010, the market basically went nowhere. But then in between, there's this huge jump and then a huge decline, 60 over percent, and then uh, it goes back to where it was uh, five years ago. Basically, it's the first five years of my investing life, right? <laughs> and um, the, the first thing is, I, I did sell half of my Netflix shares. I, I can't remember all the details, of, which I should have, because uh, taking notes is something I believe in, really but I started a bit later. But basically what I felt was, what happened was the shares went up 100%, then it went down below what I bought, and then it went back up by 100%, right? So psychologically, it means that you hold a stock, you got your 100%, which is fantastic for a new investor, and then you lost it all, and then you got it back. At that point, I, I think it was emotion driving me, right? It's like, man, I got it back, I'm not going to lose it again. And because of that, I came out with all sorts of reasons to justify selling. Uh, let's sell half and keep half. So I'm playing with the house's money. I think that's a gambling term. Uh, let's, I even ran a spreadsheet to show, look, I did my homework, you know, look at all these numbers I projected, nice spreadsheet and all very detailed. Mm, I'm correct. I, I sort of convinced myself I'm right to sell, but the truth is, I think I probably sold at around $7 per share. And today is how much? Huh? <laughs> today, Netflix shares are... 700 I think, around. $685. Yeah. <laughs> Another 100x. I, I, I think that goes to show that psychology plays a role. When you want to sell, you come up with all sorts of reasons to convince yourself to sell. As to your question, like why, what, what kept me holding on, right? Um, I do remember at one point, the shares were up like 10x, right? At that point, I, I did think about selling again. But... Uh, Part of me was curious to see what happens because you read, I mean, you read all these investing books and they show that, you know, these people hold shares for 10 years, 20 years, maybe even more. What's the point of, of reading all this if you're not going to do it, right? So I, I just convinced myself that there's only two things can happen. One, it continues going up, in which case um, there's nothing to worry about. Or the other case is where the, the stock completely crashed and then I would have learned something out of it. And I just believe that 
that the experience would have served me much better compared to whatever I read in in investing book. I was curious to also understand when you talk mm-hmm. about a lot a lot of all these. I think you you had quite a few notable examples like Amazon, Netflix, etc. I, I will presume that because you have an active income as well. Do you buy into the idea that you keep averaging up into these companies that that oh, yes. In? yes. So so have you been averaging into many of these? <laughs> I say yes, but I, I, I should be averaging a lot more. I, I have averaged up on Apple, on Amazon, uh, not on Netflix because they are like cash burning for like 10 years. And when you have a 10 bagger, quite honestly, it just completely unbalances your portfolio. Because if you think of, if, if you start with like 10 stocks, right, each one has 10%, one goes up by 100 times, the rest will kind of look like really small in comparison. I think that is very common for, for a portfolio. I think that typically if you have a huge winner, then I like to say an unbalanced portfolio is a sign of a successful portfolio. So you don't believe in the idea of balancing, the idea of selling a bit of your winners and adding to others. Okay, I have an answer for that. I I wanted to answer your previous question first. Uh, On the case of averaging up, I think averaging up is good because I'm a big believer that if you're going to invest for the long term, you got to be learning for the long term as well. I, I believe that anyone who follows a company for you know two years, three years, simply paying attention to what's happening in a company over that period of time is going to become an expert in that company, even better than whatever analyst out there. Not because the analyst is lousier than you, but because you paid attention and they, they can't, right? Because they have too many things to, to pay attention on. I got a funny story or so. <laughs> Sorry, I go segue. Uh, I remember after buying my shares of Apple, right? And then, do you know who Bruce Greenwald is? No, the, the guy who took over uh, Ben Graham at Columbia University. Notable, well-known value investor. But uh, right after I bought shares of Apple, right? Which I thought I paid a P of 27 times or so. He came on an interview and then he was talking about Apple and saying that it's too faddish. Or I may, may be putting words in his mouth, but he did mention that the the P is 50 or something, right? Which shot me to the cause like, oh my God, did I make a mistake in my calculation, right? So I went back, I, I checked my numbers and I said, no, it's 27 times. But how, how come this guy who's so well-known put it at 50 times? Which then struck me that hey, actually value investors are not paying attention to all these companies. It's for good reason. I, I don't pay attention to value stocks. So they don't pay, pay attention to growth stocks. And because of that, they might not get everything right now. So I, I think that that is also something which struck me as that's probably the only time when, when I'm correct and Bruce Greenwald was wrong. Probably the, the rest of the times he's more right than me. But I, I, I think that there's, there's an interesting lesson there where simply paying attention can actually put you way ahead of other people. And to your point where uh, why should you average up, right? I, I think that's the best scenario you have because uh, if you found a company and you've been learning about it for the past five years, 10 years, right? You should know that company inside out. And if so, that, that should be your highest conviction bet, right? And it's only natural that you should put more and more money into it if you are sure that it can continue growing. And what was your next question? I forgot already. <laughs> Talking about rebalancing, a portfolio rebalancing. Oh, rebalancing. Um, that's an interesting question. It's, it's, um, I think rebalancing is not so important when you're starting out as an investor, but it becomes maybe a bit more important when when your portfolio starts to mature. And why that is, is I think if you're a wage earner, right? So say you start with 20K and then you save like 10K per month, uh, per year, sorry. 10K per month is a lot. <laughs> so in actual fact is, that you'll be adding like one third to your portfolio every year, right? I mean, the next year. So if you're 20K, too much matter, sorry. <laughs> Even if you put like 10% or, or 2K into a stock, next year it's going to be 2K against 30K, right? And so that that percentage actually drops. And then if you add 10K again, if you add 10K again, then that 2K you put in becomes smaller and smaller, right? Then let me complicate the picture a bit so that you may not be saving 10K every year, right? You, you're going to save more and more over time because uh, presumably you got pay increases and so on. You get to save more. If you're doing a good job, your portfolio value should outpace your pace of saving, right? So you have your pace of saving here and then your portfolio value should go up way faster than your pace of saving. So it, it will reach a point where the percentage of new money coming into your portfolio becomes a smaller and smaller factor to your overall uh, portfolio size. So at this point, because my portfolio is like, what, uh, 19 years now, I've reached a point where 
I, I start to realize that whatever new money I put in is not going to make it. It's like small compared to the size of my portfolio. So I am thinking more about rebalancing today. In the past, uh, after my Netflix uh, <laughs> sell, <laughs> I, I don't think about re- rebalancing that much. I, I think that um, I think that your winners is it, a good thing to to have your winners naturally become the largest components of your portfolio, which is a good thing because then those are the companies which have taken time to grow to that size. And because they've taken time to grow to that size, then uh, presumably you would have known a lot about the company and those should be your highest conviction bets, right? So so what are you focusing on right now? Like, is it the AI stuff, uh, like NVIDIA? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I, I own NVIDIA. <laughs> so it's, you're just buying back your existing holdings? Okay. I mean, to be honest, nowadays, it's, it's very hard for me to buy shares because uh, I have a rule for myself where I, and this comes from my monthly full days, so where I don't buy or sell a stock uh, two trading days before and after we talk about a stock publicly, right? So this is considered public, right? So I won't be buying or selling any of the shares I, I talked about today. And and that sort of limits the, the window where I can start buying shares uh, because I'm spending most of my time creating content for, for others and so on, right? So I, I think for today, for AI, I, I think it's still in the... I'm, I'm looking for real use cases, uh, basically. And right now, I, I think we are in a phase where... Not NVIDIA, of course. NVIDIA is, I, I think, more or less proven already. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I think that in, in, in terms of how AI is being used, right, generative AI is being used, I, I think it's, it's still in the phase where it's still being proven out. And I don't think it's, uh, there, there are some use cases which I think useful. But then, who did this way? I, I don't think it's similar to like smartphones coming versus PCs, right? Right now, it feels a bit more incremental than revolutionary, except for NVIDIA. <laughs> Because, because I, I saw you just write one uh, article on NVIDIA, right? I, I, I right. think you, you mentioned that, okay, stock price, that's everyone watching at it, looking at it like 2x, 3x, right? But mm. uh, many people miss the fundamentals. And you, when you look through the fundamentals, you run through the number, you saw that, oh, all these numbers has actually increased. So would, would that be enough to justify a whole? Or will you say that, oh, we should do all these uh, free cash flow valuations regularly, m- maybe at least once a year and, and assess that, oh, it gets like, let's say 50% overvalued, I should sell now. Uh, what's your comment on this kind of you know, thinking? Well, firstly, I, I, I don't know if anyone two years ago pr- projected what uh, NVIDIA is going to become today. I, I would, one of the, the learnings I had from my experience with Netflix is also that valuation models are sort of like, it, it's limited by your imagination, right? You imagine the worst case scenario, you imagine the best case scenario, and you think that, oh, it's going to become like this, and it doesn't. It either outperforms whatever you can imagine. Uh, one, one of the experiences I had was when I bought shares of Apple, and this happens a lot with new technology uh, because there's there's no there's no reference point, right? All your reference points are, are outdated technology, right? In the case of Apple, when I bought it, I was thinking, okay, what if it grows by twenty five percent per year, which means it will double in about three years, right? And at that point, their their revenue was forty billion. Also, at that point in two thousand ten, thinking that a consumer product company can grow double its revenue from forty billion to eighty billion, you're being really courageous, uh, heroic. So I thought, okay, let me be conservative and then I'll put down 20% instead of 25, right? So I lowered my my calculations and so on. But, you know, guess what Apple did, right? So I, I thought it would go from 40 to 80. And that was, in my mind, best case scenario. The only comparison I had was, I think Nokia, I think they did about 70 billion revenue. So like saying that it will hit 80 is kind of, wow, so arrogant. It, you're saying that this company, which created a phone in 2007, within seven years is going to overtake Nokia just like that. that that's that's quite a ballsy prediction, right? But guess what? The the actual result, I think, is closer to 160 billion. Like, who would have put this number in their, their spreadsheet, right? And I, I think that the, the thing about innovative companies is that they, they tend to surprise you on the upside. You know, they, there's a lot of hidden value you don't see, the same way where Amazon revealed that how much they're making of AWS in 2015. And because of that, their valuation multiple actually uh, improved from that. 
I'm not sure whether I answer your question, but yeah, yeah, Sorry I, I ramble on. Actually, I, actually, I, I made I made similar comment before. Like I say all oh, this DCF uh, sounds very cool, mm. but actually, can't 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 do how. Don't don't be too serious about about that now. Uh. That's my own take don't, on, don't on DCF. Don't go DCF. Uh. I got about yeah. seven reasons why you shouldn't use DCF. <laughs> <laughs> But you, you sounds like someone who's like uh, more like a number guy, right? Like more, more oh, meticulous yeah. when it comes to calculations, but yet you, you're saying DCF, don't use but it. That's a very, actually a very good comment. Uh, I, I'm a trained engineer. I'm good at math, but I, I think that that can be a... People say always tap on your strength, right? But I think you also be, should be afraid of your strength because uh, my experience of Netflix also tells me that I look for comfort in numbers. When I, when I feel threatened or fearful, I go to numbers and numbers make me feel good. So I, I need to be aware of my tendency for that. So I, I sometimes manually divorce myself from the numbers just not to make sure that I don't get too, too attached to it. Sorry, but yeah. if you are not using DCF, then how are you mm-hmm. valuing a company? What, what I found is, and, and this is something coming up from the Tom Angle School of Thought, right? I think there's, and it sounds really basic, but it works really well. But I think if you look at the historical P ratio or the price to free cash flow, it gives you a lot of idea of where the stock should be trading. If you look at the history, it'll give you a sort of a range of where it usually trades. For the case of Apple, for example, it used to trade at around like 10 to 15 times P. And you know that uh, if you buy it at around 10, it's, it's probably a, a good a good place to, to start a position, right? And when you buy it, when, at any point where the stock is trading, you won't know how big the company will grow, but at least you know where it is compared to uh, where it traded in the history. So I, I think it's a bit similar to what uh, Howard Mark says, which is uh, you may not know where the market is going to hit in the future, but you should at least know where you are in relation to the past. I think he said that. Did he say that? Yeah, something similar to that. I may be paraphrasing or adding words to his uh, <laughs> phrase. No, I was just wondering if you uh, consider local REITs to be a good investment. Oh, I, I do own a few. For me, they're more for dividends. Uh. I do like REITs. I, I think they're quite simple to understand. And I, I think that's also a factor because sometimes, uh, like sometimes when I look at NVIDIA, for example, right, I don't understand half of what they're talking about. <laughs> and, and I have to like, uh, even after I do all this research, it's sort of like knowledge, you look at it. Uh, I, I feel the same way about cybersecurity, uh, by the way. It's like the CEO says this, like, oh, okay. Is that good? Is that bad? I, I don't know, <laughs> right? And I, I think that there, there are simple business models like REITs or, or like restaurants where it's so much easier to understand, right? For example, if they say beef prices rose, is it good or bad for restaurants? Bad, obviously. Right. You you can you, you don't really need to think a lot, and I think sometimes that helps you make decisions about the the company itself or or read by the way. So for the case of reads, uh, I I do have like a portfolio of like income producing stocks. So usual suspects are reads, banks, sprinkling of other companies like Sengxiong, iFast. iFast did really well, <laughs> surprisingly. And then um, what else do I have? Yeah, it, it's a lot more concentrated for my Singapore side because the market is smaller and therefore the sort of universe of available stocks is, uh, I, I think, less also. So so if you if you say that you hold a few reads, sorry, I assume mm-hmm. that you looked at their operating numbers. Mm. What's your thoughts on the recent two, three years? Oh, my interest. Actually, I have a theory, but then... Um, I'm trying to prove this theory. I, I think that a lot of people look at interest rates. They, they say that interest rate rose and therefore REITs fell, right? I think that is correct, but it's incomplete. I, I think that interest rates rose. It, it's not just about how high it rose, but also how fast it actually rose. And if you put it in the, the context of, I mean, if you go to any of the AGMs with the REITs, right? You always find this finance lady who is from the looks, from her appearance, she will look like super meticulous. Uh, I, I know CICT has a lady handling all the, the debt refinancing, right? And you can tell that just by looking at her, she's Im- totally immersed in the numbers and, and very uh, meticulous in her work, right? So I, I, I'm just picturing her 
trying to manage this situation where uh, interest rates go from zero to like, you know, 4% in less than a year, like nine months, right? And how, how are you going to manage a situation like this? So uh, do, do I refinance this loan right now, book uh, higher interest rates for a longer time, or should I uh, refinance right now, book a lower interest rate, but at, at a shorter period? period I, I think that 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 period of time where interest rates rose so fast it was quite a i would imagine it's a quite a harrowing time for all this all this uh read managers trying to refinance their loans so I, I think the real impact was the pace of change more so than how high the interest rates rose because uh remember that interest rates rose back in 2015 to 2018 so it went from zero to roughly about 2.5%, right? But this happened over a period of three years. And throughout that three years, you'll find many REITs which manage to increase their DPU, right? And I think it's because when it happens slowly, you got a, a chance to adjust, right? You have a chance to consider the pace of how how fast that interest rates are going to rise and how how high and you have a chance to you know charge higher rents and, and and slowly adjust the rents instead of trying to like like increase the rents by 10 20 30 percent right you you have a chance to adjust to the market situations so to speak but when when the change comes in so fast you don't have that much of a chance to change if you look at different reads uh, for example CICT their philosophy so far has been to have a higher interest rates. So if you if you look at the past ten years or so, their interest rates are when I say interest rates, I mean how much they're paying for their loans, right? It's usually around three percent, which is higher than say a FCT, right? A comparable REIT, which is also in supermarkets, where it's closer to two percent. So until recently, where FCT merged with the PGIM, is it? But until recently, basically the the stance which FCT took was they would have a lower interest rate, but also a shorter duration. For the case of CICT, it was higher interest rates, but longer duration, uh, usually around five years. I think FCT was more like two to three years. I, I think because of that, that stance they took, and this also is born out of that, that boom they had uh, in 2007, where they got burned as well. I think that was one of the learnings of CICT. I, I see that they are able to manage this cycle better because they, they have uh, a longer period of time their, their debt is spread out uh, much wider. And because of that, any refinancing which happens, they have less impact on their financing costs. And because there's less impact, they are able to adjust better compared to the other REITs. So it's one of the few REITs which managed to increase their DPU. So that's the theory I have. Uh, where, And I'm trying to prove that if you have a longer sort of period of debt, you would be able to manage that that increases better. Yeah, I also noticed that they really pay a lot of attention in like staggering the maturities, right? So yeah, yeah. In, in a way, it's managing cash flow. That one, yes. I think it's a, it's a good sign uh, showing that they, they know these are important things because they, they got burned before. But on yeah. the other hand, right, I also noticed that let's say you're comparing two reads, right? One is like having, let's say, average one to two year mm. debt. Then the other one is like, let's say, uh, CICT, five year, like you said, right? If we are looking at today's environment where interest rate is already high for some time, let's say like mm. one, two years, right? Won't like the... CICT situations will be that now they still need to refinancing uh, slowly, slowly their cost of financing will creep up. It just it just slow down the effects. It's not like uh, immune from the effect, right? Whereas yes, for, the, for the smaller one, for those that is having shorter debt, right? Mm -hmm. When you are looking at their most recent financial reports, they are already seeing a high interest cost. Mm. So it's like whatever bad that can hit them is already get hit fully. And you are looking at ah, the financial okay, statement. It's okay. like, this is, this is like the, 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 the worst already. Is there a you know like an argument to say that why don't we go and whack the smaller one instead of like those that is well managed? That, that, that's a good thought, I think. So yeah, I think you you have a point there. It may be that the worst case scenarios has hit the those with a shorter sort of uh, average periods. I I think it also depends on the the industry itself and the ability for them to sort of raise uh, rentals itself. So for the case of CICT, for example. I, I do know that even before all this happened, right, them being a supermarket, they, they cannot keep on keeping the same tenants, right? Who, who wants to go to a supermarket where the tenants are always the same? Before that, they already churn about 20% of their tenants every year, like clockwork, right? And it's by intention, right? It, it's not that they don't want to keep these tenants, it's just that they reconfigure, they renew their, their, their uh, tenant base and so on. So I think they are, they are into this practice where a portion of their tenants uh, keep on renew, renewing, and if you have good assets, then I think that gives you more flexibility to actually increase the rentals. Uh, to your point, whether or not 
worst case scenario. I haven't really looked at it, but that's an interesting thought. Maybe I'll, I'll see how I can uh, validate or invalidate what you just oh, said. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Happy to get but but that's, that's an interesting thought. Thanks yeah. for bringing it up. Yeah. Can we pivot a little bit? I want to ask you some mm. uh, other questions. Uh, not related to REITs. Uh. So mm. uh, you are currently set selling service to members or subscribers that is like mm. stock picking service, right? Mm. Uh, are you pressured to, you know, like show people like what's, what's your returns, uh, your track record, your Kager over over, the, over these years? Um, pre- Pressured as in like the service itself or what? Like, do you need to show it like tell people, see, my returns is... So oh, and so, okay. so you can trust me. Don't trust the other YouTubers that are just <laughs> talking nonsense. <laughs> who who are these other YouTubers? <laughs> uh, I think there's a marketing side to it, and I, I think you cannot avoid not talking about returns because, like it or not, as much as I preach long term returns, when you, when you run a service, I, I think people tend to want short term returns as well, which. Is something I cannot promise, right? I think what what we are lucky with is we, we have a base of subscribers with, which have gone through all these cycles, right? So we have members from like 2015 and 2016 where they've seen how long-term investing can actually work. And in a way, I, I feel like the, the most difficult path for investors to take is to, the ability to hold a stock for at least five years. And if you can do that, and I, I think there's a quote by Peter Lynch on this, by the way, where I, I found it very subjective, but yet very insightful, where he says that um, the best returns do not come from like two years or three years, but actually five years, six years, and seven years. And what I found is remarkably, with people who hold are able to hold for five years, that's when the real results turn up, right? And my, my job is to try to conjole them to... <laughs> to hold this stock for five years because I think once you see that huge winner in your portfolio, you'll be sold. And a lot of all these little niggling concerns, all these noises which you hear every day will just fade away and, and things will just make sense to you. So for Chin, I recently I went to an event, not, not just one event, I went to a few events. And the question that I always get is like, oh, Kevin, do you think the market is overvalued now? Should I, <laughs> is, is this oh, a okay. to buy now? Um, so for you, right, you're always looking for companies to invest. Like, mm. are you, do you find yourself slowing down your investment during these two years? Or are you still buying consistently? That is another good question. So I, I can share an experience I had in 2012. So in 2012, I was asked to help David Gardner with his there's this feature in his service called uh, Best Buys Now. Uh, to give some background, uh, David Gardner and, and Tom Gardner, they, they started this service called Stock Advisor back in 2002. So that is what, 22 years ago, right? And then they would recommend two stocks every month. And so you think about it, 22 years, two stocks every month over over this period, there's a lot of stocks within that, that two universes. So there's a Tom side of the portfolio of the recommendation and there's a David sign up. So he has this uh, sort of feature which picks five stocks from David's universe of stocks to say that these are the best buys now. So I was maybe one of 20 people who would do this in the background. So this will not be seen where I, I would suggest these are the five stocks which I think are buy right now. And then uh, David Garner would make that final decision. Sorry, I take a very long way to answer your question. But basically, I, I did this thing where when I first started, I, I hated the process because now I have to pick five stocks every month regardless of where the market is. And I have to force myself to do it. But then what I did is I started tracking all these stocks. Up. I would write down all these five companies which I think I would buy, which I sent to David Garner. And then I would also put these are what I actually did, right? But after a year, I found that, you know what? The the five stocks <laughs> which I picked uh, outperform what, whatever I actually did, which is to say that I could have gotten the returns if I followed my own damn recommendations of picking five stocks instead of what I actually did, which was actually good timing because guess what? Uh, even though the market is supposed to fall like 10% every two years or or 11 months, depending on which statistics you look at, the market did not correct for a period of five years. Meaning for a period of five years, there was no 10% correction at all, zero. Because coming out of the great financial crisis, right, there was always this fear of double dip crash, right? So there was a 20% decline in 2010, there was a 20% decline in 2011. But then 
when it comes to 2012 to I think 2016, I want to say, I, I might be wrong with the period, but I know there's a five-year period. The market did not crash at all for by 10%, right? No correction at all for a five-year period. And if you've held back during that period, you have missed out on five years of gains, which is a huge, huge uh, difference, I think. So I've come to believe that we should continue buying every month, even though I'm not able to practice this every month on myself, but I, I do practice it in my service. Where every month, regardless of what's happening, I will still continue to buy. The, I also get a question like, like Mark, in fact, I just got that question yesterday. <laughs> I, was, I was filming for Channel News Asia. I think the answer to that question where, you know, should you buy or not, there's no real answer, right? Because I think that the real, that, that question is not really about should you buy or not. It's about fear, right? Because no one wants to look stupid. I buy it and the, the market crash. Or, you know, I made all this gain, then I lose all my gains, right? So it's it's really fear we're talking about. And I think the best way to solve it is really about turning that worry into action. Uh, why not take that worry and, and you know, come out with a list of stocks which you're going to buy if the market crashes, right? Instead of trying to do valuation or thinking whether or not this stock will crash. You no, know, there's not all the stocks. If valuation did not matter today, which are the stocks you're going to buy? Make sure you're very clear on it. Do all your homework. And from there, there's only two paths you can take. Either you buy a little bit and, and wait for better prices, or if the market crashed, then you would have your list ready, right? So I, I think that that's the better uh, approach. Chin, do you pay attention to technical side? Like, do you wait for the <laughs> breathe in, breathe out, and then... <laughs> Stay away now first and then wait for the market deep yeah. and only no technical yeah. no none at all. No. Do you do you think do you think the approach of following this kind of technical do you think this is all astrology or <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't like talking about things which I've not tried now. So I I know many are critical about it, but then for me it's like I, I never really tried it. So I, I don't even know whether it works or not. And I don't really understand it at all. For me, I never found a use for it really. So like why so I, I never used it at all does it work have you do you all know <laughs> i don't yeah have, have you found anyone who is consistently correct using technical analysis Cons- the correct part don't have uh, the consistent one yes la. consistently <laughs> wrong <laughs> every time try oh. time to try to you, trade you, you know the there's, there's there's this funny uh story about this uh brokerage firm you, you can look for this medium post by tim hansen right there's this brokerage firm which um they 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 offered all the traders i think free free brokerage fees uh, and then they were not making any money right if i'm not wrong what they did was initially they they told the brokers or uh, all the traders that okay i'm not going to charge you any brokerage fees but i'm going to take a cut of your profits uh, problem is all these traders they they lose money la. <laughs> so they you couldn't make any money right so they came up with this in ingenious slash illegal way where they would take the orders receive the orders but then they don't do anything about it so they they take the money which the the traders put in but then they didn't actually execute the trades so they are they are the so house they're actually la. making money <laughs> Well, well, the traders think they're losing money, right? And then, of course, in the end, they got exposed. But it just shows like just a very st- funny story that that trade you could actually bet against traders making money and, and actually make money out of it. So I think we uh, maybe just the last question to round up, right? I think we have mm-hmm. extended the discussion quite a lot in the US market and the Singapore mm-hmm. market, right? Mm-hmm. Just wanted to know in the, the probably the second largest market, do you have any exposure in China or Hong Kong or what's your general thoughts on that? Oh, okay. I do have do have two Hong Kong stocks, JD and uh, Tencent. I don't think they're doing well. I haven't checked. <laughs> I don't look at my stock prices every day. Uh, but um, yeah, the, the thing about China is where I, I think there was a great comment by the, the fund manager, RV Capital, where he said that because we live in democratic societies, when we are faced with the change, the pace of changes which China implements, we are not used to it because the pace of business change or regulations which we experience is much more gradual rather than immediate, right? But in China, because we are not in the country, any changes, you, you have no feel on the ground that you know these changes are coming and, and government is unhappy about certain things and so on, right? That when any change comes, it always feels very sudden and, and very immediate and i think that's the most difficult part to deal with uh, because you you just don't know where 
as as my friend Sergin likes to say, each company seems to be serving two masters, where some of them would have to be forced to do national service and, and do things which are out of the ordinary, uh, buy a bank or whatever. I, I think that the, if I'm not wrong, China Mobile invested in banks during the financial crisis. I need to check that that fact. But there there are really weird things which happen along the way where companies will be forced to invest into companies or help support each other, which. I think it's just something which does not happen in the US, and it's not like a scenario you you, you think about. Ken, thanks for um, the discussion. I think there were a lot of uh, good pointers, and I guess it's a different, it's a breath of fresh air because I think we haven't gotten a hundred bagger guests onto <laughs> onto our podcast yet. So if you guys enjoyed the discussion, remember to help smash that like button and if you guys have any comments or anything just feel free to leave in the comments below and maybe we can even get chin on a second episode we'll see you guys in the next episode goodbye thanks